Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming all the way out here for what will be a wonderful conversation. Uh, I want to start by thanking everyone for being here and for joining us online. And I also want to start by congratulating Mark and Leon on book launch week. Your book is officially out. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, and I'm going to start by asking, you write that this book is the first in what you hope will be a series dedicated to NCIS agents and its history, but the agency was created in the 90s. And yet we start this book with World War II in the days leading up to World War II. So can you tell us about that? Well, first of all, Nancy, thanks for having us here. Can everybody hear the mic? Is that okay? I, <clears throat> it actually goes back to 1882. We started as the Office of Naval Intelligence in 1882. And this particular thing that we're doing now came out of the NCIS Association's history organization. And when I was asked by Mark to partner, what do you want to partner on? So we had a several, several things we could select, but we picked World War II because it's really where our agency, NCIS, prior, prior to that was NIS, and prior to that was ONI. It's really where we got steeped into counterintelligence and counterespionage before World War II. So when we look at the evolution of the organization, when you watch the show, you see a murder a week, and 90, <laughs> and we've done 460 some odd, 460 episodes. 90% have been death cases or, or homicides, or death cases, NCIS does any unattended death in the Marine Corps or the Navy. And you uh, always solve them. We, well, somebody <laughs> else solves them now, <laughs> but uh, no, they're really good. But it's probably number four or five on the list of things that we do. And I was a foreign counterintelligence guy, and Doug Wada, his story just kind of hit me because it was like looking at one of the originators of my craft. So that's why we, one of the reasons why we picked yeah, can you tell us a little bit about Douglas Wada? Sure. Uh, Douglas Wada was a Nisei. His, his father was a Shinto uh, carpenter. They, he emigrated uh, to Hawaii, and they, the parents decided that they wanted their young son to know a little bit more about their culture in Japan, so they sent, sent him to Japan. Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> it means we have to scare you. <laughs> that was a haircut. What's so, sneeze like? <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> so, they, <laughs> so they sent him to Japan to learn the culture and learn the language, uh, and he came back and went to school at, in, at the University of Hawaii and uh, kind of was recruited there. And the rest of it's kind of in the book, but if you want to know specifics, we'll talk about that as well. But that's kind of his background. And as Marcus said before, he was kind of the guy for the job. And, uh, you know, the Navy definitely, he was the first Japanese American special agent with our organization, the first non Caucasian uh, with our outfit. And I definitely want to delve into his story, but Mark, what was your reaction whenever you first heard about Douglas Wada and why you wanted to center this series on him, or this book in the series on him? This, this book kind of matches our own reveal of the story. Um, that Leon Carroll, who was a real NCIS agent, that's what I want to, I've been pointing that out all, all day today, on to every show we've been on, because this is real. Okay. This, this is, is fake. real R E. <laughs> this guy is real R E E L. Okay. R E E L. <laughs> but Leon, Leon was an agent, special agent for over 20 years, and he never heard of Douglas Wada, right? And part of that is by intent, because uh, the job these individuals did was a quiet one, and and always well done. Great pride in that, and. When we started talking about, when, when I first got the part on the show, it was originally based on true stories. So I got used to coming to work and, you know, I mean, we did. We had bodies in every, every episode because if you don't have bodies, my column doesn't work, neither does Perrette, right? <laughs> and, 
And so that formula started to get a hold, and that show has become successful, successful and that's great. Um, but that's not what this is. This, this, the opportunity to do this book was really to talk about the real. And in doing that and turning the clock back to where it started, this was the first story. This was really, he was the first guy. And, and if we, in turn, by doing this book, um, focus a bit of a light on Douglas Wada, it's way overdue. And, uh, and we've, we've, we've done a lot of things with this book and the effort we've put into it and the story we're telling. But if, if from the end of this, he's thanked as well, that's important to us as well. And it should be to this country as well. Yeah. And I also understand, can I ask, you've had a special surprise just in the past couple of days involving Douglas Wada. Yes, that's, yeah. that's true. Uh, throughout this process, we did a lot of research. We determined you know, family members who were surviving, and we wanted to get input from them, or at least some, some idea of what, how they saw their, their father or grandfather. And uh, we kept running into kind of brick walls. We had, before we were involved uh, with any of this study, the researchers before us had contacted the grandson and talked to the grandson, and it appeared that he probably didn't really want the family involved in that. And so yesterday, after we had done an event, I'm in our hotel room, and I get a, a phone call. And I look at it, and I almost didn't answer it on myself, because you get a lot of scam calls, especially in the middle of the day. And Ignore those usually. <laughs> and I do too, but, but this one I saw, the last name was Japanese. And actually, I thought it was somebody who had already heard something bad about the, in the book and they wanted to complain, right? And I decided to answer it and it was Doug Wada's uh, grandson. And a tear came to my eye. And he said to me, he says, Leon, I want to, actually call me Mr. Carroll, I just want to thank you for what you've done for our family by recognizing our, my grandfather. And I go, you don't know how happy I am that you called me to let us know that you're happy about that. And they had found out from a, from a friend of the mom. And, and the mother, I, I was hesitant to call her because I thought she was 90 plus years old. Turns out she's 80 and she lives with him. And it was a friend of hers who told her about the book coming out. So that, was, uh, that really made my, my day and my stay here in New York actually. Mark, what for you has really stood out in the feedback that you've gotten from this book so far? I know that you've been meeting with former agents, current agents, and there's been a lot of good response. Um, these people were never asked the question. They were never asked to talk about what they did. Uh, and I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed um, somewhat providing an opportunity to let them tell their story. Just like, in a different way, this book allows Douglas Wada to tell his. Um, that phone call from them yesterday, and we both talked to them, um, that's important, you know, for a lot of other reasons. And we talked about this a lot during the, the process of the book, and uh, you don't you don't want to offend anybody. You're not you're not trying to destroy anybody's life. You're you're, you're trying to tell an honest story of, uh, I mean, a really special guy. You know, he, special skill set, special time, uh, inordinate uh, ability to be the only one who could do what he did. And if again, if if that from this book kind of focuses something on this guy that people weren't talking about a week ago, um, then we've done something right here. It also speaks to what you were saying to me in the green room before we came out here, is when you first got the role on the show, you Googled NCIS and not much came up. Nothing, nothing came up. <laughs> and now when you Google it, it's pages and pages dedicated to the show, but you wanted to shine a spotlight. Do you know why? Why is that? There was no Google back then. <laughs> <laughs> Ask 
ask go, Jeeves? Go, yeah, Google, Google, ask Leon. It's the same thing. <laughs> but now. Yeah, now, now you can find stuff. And, and that's because of a TV show. I mean, NCIS used to have to recruit people in colleges to get them to come want to be agents. They had to explain things. Now the TV show does that. They, they don't recruit anymore. They don't need to. Have you, have you seen that change just in the time that the show has been on? Oh, absolutely. I can talk to that because at the end of my career, that's what I did. I, I went out and recruited, in fact, at your husband's alma mater, yes. and I just gave him and kudos. Mine. Oh, oh, that's right. You're, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. USC. <laughs> so, so they both went to USC, <laughs> and I would have to say that uh, when I was recruiting, and, and my territory and my partner's territory was all the way up into Utah, we did Colorado uh, and uh, USC. Those students came to those job fairs like they wanted a job right now, dressed to the, you know, business trust and very sharp. And there were other schools, they were the only school that was like that. So when I was doing that, this was before obviously I came on to the show, it was before the show, and it was tough to get these students to understand what NCIS was. There had been no TV show. And when I came on, we were NIS, and you answer the phone NIS, and they go, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, wasn't, I was trying to get INS, but we don't do that. So, <laughs> so we did have an identity problem, but from the days, early days of WADA days, it was, it was the way they wanted it to be. Uh, up until the mid-60s, our agents were being paid with private personal checks. And it wasn't until there was an issue in accounting with the government that they said, oh, wait, we can't do that. And they started paying them, I think, in 66 or 67 with government checks. And, um, you know, it was one of those things when they started hiring law enforcement uh, police officers and things like that, uh, people that were in other law enforcement agencies as well, that the whole criminal aspect was highlighted. And we, when I came on, they were looking for former military and former cops. And when I was recruiting, we were looking for foreign languages and computer skills. And just, uh, I was in Nashville in September at the uh, NCIS Association, which is retirees and uh, administrative employees. We have our association. And uh, our director, the NCIS director, who by the way, I didn't realize this, but during this whole recruiting process, I had actually been the first NCIS agent to talk to him. I pre-screened him. The process is you have a pre-screen after your application, and I could have weeded him out, and I didn't. And, and the funny part about that was I for, had forgotten about it because I had you know, interviewed hundreds of people probably, but he visited our set after he got hired, and I, I was just impressed with the guy. But it turned out, he corrected me at this uh, banquet, that I, he had actually met me then. And so that's where I was really more impressed in the recruiting process, not when he was out you know, vacationing, doing a boondoggle you know, from work on the set. So I, I think at this point, and when he got up and spoke, I spoke before him, he thanked me and reminded me the second time that I had screened him and I was the reason why he was with the, on the job. And it, it was just strange that he, when he said, you know, NCIS now, we're only second to the FBI in numbers of people that apply for the job. Now, think about this. The FBI has 40,000 people. We have 2,500. So there are more people applying to become NCIS agents than there are DEA, Secret Service, you name it, it's 40, 40 some odd federal agencies. So that's all about the TV show, and that's all about everybody wanting to be Leroy Jethro Gibbs. A good role model to have. <laughs> we got some thoughts there, Mark? <laughs> no. uh, uh, well, when I, when I uh, you know, got to know Leon, and uh, it was, we had a lot of long days in the beginning of doing this show, and uh, it, this was another long day, maybe, you know, probably three, four in the morning and going on 22 hours. And I was going into interrogation, and 
I always would talk to Leon about well, what are we trying to do here? Where, you know, subtle things like where the chair is, where your hands are, where your eyes are. Uh, you know, in trying to put some of uh, his technique into the character. Um, and he <laughs> again, it's two in the morning, but he kind of shouldered me into a wall and got in my face and. Uh, he was a Marine before he was an NCIS agent, so that's pretty close, it's like that. <laughs> and he said, this was my thing, <laughs> like that. And I, my eyes probably got pretty wide, and, uh, and I never went into that interrogation room again without talking to him about what it was he was trying to accomplish in there. Not so much what the person you're talking to is, but, but what would he do? And I had 20 years of that with him, or 19 years, and, and so when the opportunity came to endeavor this book, um, the very first thing I said, I was not touch this without Leon Carroll. What was that working relationship like between the two of you? What surprised you that you didn't expect outside of the interrogation tactics? <laughs> Well, you know, this is 19 years later now, and we're pals, and we know each other, but it was hard to get anything out of him in, in the beginning, and, and, and he was feeling that job just like I was feeling that job, and we're trying to get to some kind of area where we can trust each other enough to say, look, I'm not, I'm just trying to play the truth of the character, and, and Leon's trying not to tell the Hollywood guy a bunch of stuff about a secret agency, you know? <laughs> So I get it, I get it. And then, and then he has to work also with other actors, and actors are different. And then there are actors who, who say, don't talk to me, I'm an actor. You know, and you go, really? <laughs> right? Uh, it's just, it's an individual choice, as anything is. And, and I was fortunate to hook up with him early on, in this process. And, and again, if, if this book is a thank you to Doug Wada, it's also a thank you from me to Leon Carroll. I love that. That's wonderful. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm doing what I can. <laughs> <laughs> can I call it a bromance? Is that <laughs> you know, I've thought about that. Uh, and you know what? It, it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the record, we got a bromance happening right here. No, I, I'll tell you, you know, Mark is the greatest. And I don't want this to be the, the love fest here. But, um, you know, most actors are into their acting. And I did have an actor tell me, Leon, you know, I'm an actor that plays an agent. I'm not an agent. And so sometimes you have to really feel out all of these, you know, different individual personalities. And, you know, the, the agency actually trained me to do that because we have diverse people. I know earlier someone was talking about college and that, but our agency will will bring in people from anthropology to zoology. You don't have to have a criminal justice background, and I would say maybe half do. And, and uh, forensic sciences now is a big, big thing. It was uh, just as I was leaving. Actually, I recruited a lot of masters of forensic science people in the two years that I was recruiting. But I, I, I think that getting back to the WADA and, and the book story, one of the things that NCIS was, has always been noted for are interrogations. And when, when I was putting together this book, there was a book called ONI 61 Bravo. We called it the Blue Max. It was the manual that they used when, in Wada's days, right, in the 40s. And when I came on in 1980, some of those books were still around. I never used them because we already had updated what we call NIST 1 and NIST 3 books, one for administration, one for criminal investigations. So, but you always wanted to look at that, and you know when, when you're putting together this, this story, where WADA's using a lot, we're using a lot of the same techniques that WADA was using, and I don't, I know he didn't have formal training like we did when he first started. He was kind of doing it, kind of, you know, fly by night. And, uh, and he did a great job, but, uh, that, that's kind of the evolution of the organization from World War II up until when I left uh, 20 years ago. 
As the show's technical advisor, I'm curious to know how, how hard it was to strike that balance between being true to what you knew happened in the agency and, and what makes good television and how important it is to get it right. Let me tell you, that was hard. It was really hard at first. But, you know, I'm pretty flexible on things. I, you know, I try to feel out, you know, the atmosphere a little bit. And it always helps to have somebody like Mark and, you know, show's creator to say, hey, we're going to do it the way Leon wants to do it as long as it doesn't lose entertainment value. Because, you know, a real agent, uh, and it doesn't matter what agency, most are, are doing paperwork, writing reports. You're talking to people and writing reports. We'd never be a number one show if that's what we showed. So, <laughs> so you know, there were times, I, I remember the first day on set, and uh, <laughs> I was watching, we had these little teeny black and white monitors. You'd think we were in the 1950s watching TV. And, and our, our director at that time uh, for that episode was Don Belisario, who created the show. And first thing that happened was first, before the first take, Don looks at that and he goes, what is that on that guy's face? And this guy was playing a secret service, service agent. And somebody says, oh, that's a goatee. He's doing a play and we've said he could keep it for this. <laughs> and, and Don says, no, he can't. Either that goes or he goes. So Mark mentioned this was a 21 hour day for him. It was about like 19 for me. And we, that held up the first shot for about 45 minutes so this guy could take, shave, shave his uh, goatee. Well, then we get into the shot and we're on Air Force One and he's protecting the president, right? At that time it was uh, George W. Bush. And he's walking around with the president with his arm on his shoulder like they're buddies, right? Now, have you ever seen a Secret Service with their <laughs> arms around them? So I went up to him and I said, I says, hey, you're not the president's buddy. You're supposed to be protecting him. And his response was, well, who are you, a director or something? And I told him I was the uh, technical advisor. And he didn't do it. He stopped doing it because he knew that all I had to do was talk to the director. He, he didn't want to hear from Don Belisario, I can tell you. Because he'd already had one strike with the goatee. Now he's gone. So I, I think it was, that part was somewhat difficult. But you learn to work with directors and actors. And you get to know their. One of the things in interrogation, uh, when you learn this, those skills, you learn how to really kind of size up people pretty quickly pretty quick. This guy can do it and he, without any training. He's very good at that. And so those are the things you learn. And what I, because I knew nothing about TV. That first day, I thought we were going to have this episode all done in one day, right? <laughs> it, it takes eight, right? And I was like, when are we going home? You know, come, come 18th, come, <laughs> come. And then after the 19 hour day, I had to come back a few hours later for a 10 o'clock meeting, right? It's like two in the morning or whatever. But I had to be back for a 10 o'clock meeting on the next episode. So I was like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but I, I think that uh, it, it meant so much to have the jargon right. You know, one of the things I really was a stickler on was how they do things like handcuffing. And then in the beginning, we actually did things like fingerprinting now we may do a raid here or there, but we're using like air guns or something. But, but I think it's important for them, the, the, the uh, actors, not to embarrass the agency. And that's, that's kind of where it lies. Mark, when you hear about all of this and when you heard it in real time, did you think, oh, this is a fun challenge or who is this guy? No, I was, uh, I was so excited to have someone tell me. Um, and our, our friendship formed quickly, and, and our trust formed quickly. Um, it's interesting, because I'm hearing the stories now from his point of view. Um, and his learning curve was like my learning curve, just different, right? Um, but over the amount of time we did the show, you, you learn to trust people, and, you, and you're, you're kind of hanging it out there, because someone else is telling you how to do it, and you're trying to do it right. I remember on a, uh, we were doing a crime scene one day and everybody's 
doing like actor stuff, you know, when you walk through a crime scene looking, looking around, right? <laughs> Leon said, don't forget to look up, right? Now, in, on a stage, when you look up, all you see is lights and guys hanging up there. They're all over the place. But sometimes, or at times, why not? The evidence could be up. But it was something that my character did for 18 years, right? And I'd look at it sometimes on TV, and I'd say, well, there I am, looking up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else is doing that. <laughs> but you know what? I, I didn't care. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it right. And, and in the same time, I'm trying to honor someone who's done this job well for a long time. And, and again, nobody knew about it. You know, so respect. They know now. Yeah, they do. They know now. That's great. Uh, when we talk about this book, going back to this book, I found it to be incredibly poignant. Um, also, because I know we're focusing on Douglas Wada, but there are, it really sets the stage in the weeks, months leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And you see it from a variety of perspectives, both on the Japanese side and on the American side. And I thought what was particularly poignant about that was it doesn't, it doesn't villainize the Japanese side. You really see it through the perspective of these men who were about to face this huge, huge challenge. Why was that important to you as you were laying out this book? Well, I'll give you one example from that, from the book, is when the submarine was, be well, beached, and uh, not to, I don't give too much away, but, but when they brought in the surviving crew member uh, for interview and interrogation, he expected something different than what he got. And when you talk to, whether it be prisoners of war, which this person was the first prisoner of war uh, in World War II, uh, after, during the December 7th uh, landing or attack. And WADA and, and uh, EY, uh, Army uh, Nisei military intelligence individual, they had, the, they had the task of talking to this guy first. And, uh, well, probably first and last. But anyway, it wasn't like they treated him ill and he expected that. He expected he, was, he had been shamed because he had failed in his mission and actually wanted to kill himself. And they were able, to, they talked him out of that and able to get information that, that was really needed for the rest of the, for that particular time in Pearl Harbor. So I, I think the feeling was, and, and both of these guys were Nisei, right? Second, well, first generation Americans whose parents had brought them or had come to Hawaii and they were born there. They were loyal people, and our country did not treat them that way. And these two guys really wanted to make sure that they showed the patriotism that their generation and even the previous generation had had for the United States as opposed to Japan. I think there's been a lot of talk also about uh, Japanese internment camps, Japanese American internment camps. But even in this book, we see the loyalty of so many Japanese Americans being questioned. And I think that that also has to, that speaks to the, the challenges that so many of these, I guess they weren't officially special agents, but these officers faced. Well, with Wada, initially he was not a special agent when he first started in 1938. But you know, we had winds of war coming before the actual attack on Pearl Harbor, and he was one of those who was recruited specifically to glean information from Japanese sources as to what was going on. And I think that uh, by doing that, he progressed, progressed, and progressed, and became a special agent. Went back and forth. Back in those days, we had both civilian agents and we had military. And sometimes they would go back and forth. Doug Wada was one of those. He received a, du a direct commission in the Navy. And I don't know, I'm sure people in here know the history of the Navy during World War II. They didn't allow Japanese Americans to join the US Navy. And so Wada was doing most of that work during World War II until Frank Knox passed away in 1944 as a civilian. Then he went officer, and, and, and that culture Sometimes being a military officer 
is much more important, gives you much more importance than being a civilian. And so I, I remember seeing, we, during this research, we came up with his, his retirement card when he joined the NCIS Association, and he had Special Agent Doug Wada, and then he had put in parentheses, undercover. So it was great. And that's why it's been so special to be able to share his story like this. It is, yeah. correct. Um, Mark, I want to ask you, I know that you have put in so much homework over the decades into the agency. What did you learn that surprised you in the research for this book? The biggest thing uh, was what I touched on earlier, was that these people were never asked. And, and if there's a story to tell, you just have to ask the questions, right? So uh, that, was a, that was an enjoyable process to, to, to hear about these things for the first time. Uh, I was uh, surprised that Leon didn't know about Douglas Wada. Um, but I, again, it's going back to what we talked about in the beginning of this. Uh, that was on purpose, right? <laughs> You weren't supposed to know. Um, but it's really important, too, to understand the time of this. Uh, Asian American in Hawaii, 1940, uh, powerful Japan, you know, flexing its muscles in every direction. Um, Doug, Doug fought a lot of different things, right? And so one of those was the work he did, and he was the only guy that could do what he did. He, you know, Leon started to touch on that, which is the first prisoner of war, World War II, which was a mini sub commander who ended up naked on a beach. His uh, his sub got caught on a reef, and they tried to swim for it. His his co-pilot drowned, and he he made it to the beach. And the guy that talked to him and interrogated him was Douglas Wada. Uh, he did think he was going to get killed. He spent all those years in a, in a camp here, stateside, finally went home after the war, and his name was on the, the shrine of all the people who had been killed at Pearl Harbor and during the war, and his family had written him off. Um, and they were a little upset about that, you know? Um, 30 years later, that guy's the head guy for Toyota in Brazil. So did Doug Wada have something to do with that? I think so, maybe. Um, so those kind of reveals all the way through the book and the research were, were fascinating to me. I like history. I like to learn. Uh, I like this guy. And, and, uh, and if, if this story starts to um, give credit to so many who have lived their whole life and not had it, I think that's a good thing. If I could add, you know, when we were doing this book, it was kind of my challenge to find people that knew Doug Wada in the organization. And that was quite interesting because there were, he was the first Nisei hired, but after him, there were others. And there may have been, they may, there may be one, there are two that are still alive, but they're in their 90s, well into their 90s, and not really able to communicate. But I, I thought to myself, that's what started this, uh, you know, and, and now we have quite a few. In fact, our number two person is now, she's part Japanese and she's Hawaiian. She's the deputy director, one of the two deputy directors. And she's very interested in this. And one of the things that we want to do is reward WADA with a recognition, and they have, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander Month every year. This year I was invited because of Doug Wada, and they actually did a celebration for him. And out of that came an initiative to actually have an award for him for the National Association of Asian Police Officers, hopefully next summer. So his story is being told, but when I was trying to find people who knew him, and at the Nashville uh, convention I went to, a guy came up to me after I spoke and he says, I knew Doug Wada. And he says, I only saw him once or twice. I never knew what he did. And he says, they'd come in the office and, and 
he'd go in, and nobody knew what he, and I says, well, was he an agent? He says, we all knew he carried special agent credentials, but, you know, we really never got to know him very well. So some people back in those days knew of him, but he's like a ghost, right? They, they, they didn't know much about him, so. And, and you see how much attention is being paid now. And I want to circle back on what we were talking about in the beginning, which is you're hoping this is the first in a series. So can you give us a sneak peek into other times in history that you might want to delve into next? Pretty much any time. Uh, yeah, any time. <laughs> you know, Should I ask the publisher that's also here? <laughs> yeah, Matt Bauer, ask him. But uh, we'd like to cover, what we really want to do is cover stories within the agency, highlighting agents and, and people, families as well, you know, in the future. But it, it doesn't have to be a chronological historical thing, I don't think, but just something that the public may have not heard about before. And, and even if they've heard about it, kind of the backstory from an NCIS perspective. And that's what this book is. Uh, Mark, I know we also have a lot of fans of the show here, so I have to ask you a few questions on their behalf, show specific wise. Uh, first, do you still remember any of Gibbs' infamous rules? And if so, do you still follow any of them today? I always carry a knife. <laughs> I always like to always be specific when you lie. That might have come from Leon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, you have something to say about that? <laughs> I better shut up on that. <laughs> uh, did either of you have a favorite episode or hardest send-off? We may, we may have had, and we haven't discussed this because there's so, so many, but um, we probably, we may have the same one. Call of Silence. Charles Durning in season two, as a matter of fact. Yep. And uh, speaking of World War II, he played a World War II Marine who was surrendering because he thought he killed his friend. And uh, I just remember one night coming in late, we were still working long hours, and I came in on a Friday, like seven or eight o'clock, and back in those days, we actually had hills behind our studios that looked like Iwo Jima, right? And I pull in the parking lot, and I walk in the building, and I see all of these guys dressed in Japanese uniforms from World War II. And I thought, wow, this is going to be something. And it really was. It, it was a heck of an episode, and I, I know Mark has thoughts about that. That may not have been his favorite one, but, but that was one of mine. Your turn. <laughs> I, I, there's, there's a number of them, but um, you, you know, as an actor, you have an opportunity. Uh, Leon's talking about Call of Silence, but that was opposite Charles Durning, who is no longer with us. And, and I remember that fondly because of that, mainly working with him like we did for the, the hours and days that we did. Um, but I think if you were to get five or six cast members here and ask them their favorite show, they, they would all tell you different shows. And most of them would tell you the ones that are about them. <laughs> are there any special moments that you look back on very fondly? I, I, I look back on the experiences fondly, and people, I guess, don't really remember, but this show didn't jump out. Like, people, people think this was a hit from the start. It wasn't. <clears throat> we were all scrambling and no one really knew where it was going um, and and there was a lot of people on this show working hard and if I miss any part of it it's the lunches sitting talking to people and talking about things their family you know away from the show um, a lot of people worked hard on that show and and we were a couple of them but but I think the, the success is responsible to many, not, not, not just a couple of guys sitting up here. I, I think whenever you said, what was it, a 22-hour workday for you one day, Mark? First day. No, first day. One day? Yeah. <laughs> a, no, we, were, we, got, we got behind so quickly. And uh, no, normally an hour TV show shoots in seven days, eight days. And those are like 
normal days. And television production, those days aren't really normal. Those are probably an average 14, 15 hour days, um, which are still long. And, uh, but we got so far behind, the, the very first show we did took 17 days. So that means that the next show, the director and the, everybody who's working already prepping the next show, that means that <laughs> they're behind already when they start. There's a bunch of days behind. And, and we started losing directors because they had to go do other work. So we started working six day weeks and working Saturday as well. And they had to deal with the crew. With the, you didn't have to come on Saturday. You could, you could call in sick and you didn't have to come. They didn't say that to the actors. <laughs> you were there. I was there. Um, but, but it can be a, a tough job. And, and, and yet, you know, there's a lot of people responsible for how hard they work there. there I used to remind actors all the time that uh, sometime an actor would act up a little bit and stuff. And I, I just would always say, look, there, there's, I don't know what time your call was today, but I guarantee you there was someone here before you. And I guarantee you, too, that they're making a lot less than you are. All right? So, you know. Shows a lot of Get your head out of your ass and go to work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I like the long pause right before I had, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, leadership on a TV show is not a popular thing sometimes. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of people working hard on that show and are real proud of it, and they should be. Because where that show is now in year 19, year 20, that just doesn't happen. I mean, currently the world's most successful television franchise airing on CBS, by the way. <laughs> um, I also know that a lot of people would want to ask you, do you think we might see any appearances from Special Agent Gibbs in the near future? I'm not a writer. I mean, I can't say that now, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, I uh, you know what, I, as far as I know, he's fishing in Alaska. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> And you know, look, as an actor, I always paid attention to the writing room and who was involved in the show, and, uh, and, and there's changes in a show that's been around 20 years, always changes, and showrunners change, and writers change, and actors change, and um, there's kind of an ebb and flow of all that, and, and uh, I just paid attention to the story, and I thought the story was honest, and I thought, if that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do, and... They still didn't tell me how they get the boat out of the basement, but other than that... <laughs> That's the shout-out. <laughs> but you're still involved with the show as an executive producer now. Yeah, my name's on it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, whether they listened, uh, you know, once I wasn't there every day. Uh, I mean, my job, I took seriously, and I, you know, that... that that involves reading ahead and noting, and you already have very little time during the week, week to just learn your dialogue and, and all that kind of stuff and make sure the script's on time, all that stuff. Um, w once the character left, I still continue to do that. And, and then at some point, I thought, they're not listening. <laughs> and, and that's their right too. You know, they don't have to listen. And it, when I was there all the time, Maybe they had to listen a little more, but um, I, I, I often don't watch it uh, just because uh, it, it's just it, it's <laughs> it's just a, a big separation from when you left and, and the people you left, and I care about those people still. So, yeah. including the guy sitting on your right. That's why we're here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd like to say something about that, going back to that first day. So Mark was already pretty good at sizing people up, and you know, between takes, he'd come and sit next to me and interrogate me, right? <laughs> and ask me, where are you from? What do you like to do? All, all kinds of things that I, I thought, what is, what is he trying to get? Well, I knew what he was doing, but anyway. <laughs> so he says, well, you're from Chicago. Are you a Cubs fan or a White Sox fan? I said, dude, I just told you I'm from the South Side, you know? It's, if you're a South Sider, you're a White Sox fan. And he goes, oh, really? He goes, well, I think I, I got something you'll like, right? This is at the very beginning of the morning. 
And that day was brutal. We were filming on the Air Force One set, and they only had air conditioning going through the fuselage. And we were in this big butler building. It was over 100 degrees in there. And there were a couple of takes where he is having this kind of love thing going on in the, in the lab laboratory <laughs> with, <laughs> with, with uh, Kate Todd. Is that a love thing? <laughs> But you always had that redhead picking you up, but that was, this wasn't her. But, but uh, we're gonna know, have to ask some follow up on that later. <laughs> but you know how small airplane lavatories are, right? You get two people in there, and they're like this. Well, in this set, the top was open, and they had this huge 50k light. It, it must have heated that thing up 200 degrees. And director yelled, "Cut!" Bam! The door flew open, and I can't tell you what he said because, you know, it was it was there were bad words. Let's put it that way. And I thought, wow, this is brutal. They're killing these guys. So the next morning we come back, and Mark comes up and he says, "Hey, this is what I got for you." And it was a brick from the old Comiskey Park that they had torn down. And I'm like, this guy just worked 22 hours, probably had four, three or four hours sleep in his back, and he remembered that he told me early in the morning that he had this, he had something for me. So that, from then on, I thought, this guy is amazing, because I had even forgot he had told me that, right? <laughs> so I, I think with the leadership that our, our crew had with Mark, I mean, I, and I'm not kissing anybody's butt, I've worked for a lot of Marine senior people and NCIS senior people, I was one. This guy's the best leader I've ever worked with. And he takes care of his troops, which is you know something we learn in Marine Corps real quick. And he's not a former Marine. But when we have break for lunch, and he hasn't gone, if the, when they, they break the actors first usually, but sometimes he stays around and, and the line forms out there. Instead of going up to the front of the line, he does what a good Marine officer does. He stands behind his troops. And that kind of made, I'm sure, some of the background, or extras as you would call them, feel bad because they're like, oh, we can't do it because union contract says, you know, these guys eat first. He wouldn't do it. And I think to the point where he felt that they felt kind of guilty about it, he would go in his trailer and wait till everybody had eaten and then go out and get his, his food. So. That's the kind of guy Mark Harmon is. That's amazing. Do you get a hug right there? <laughs> On that note, oh yes, I was gonna say, Mark. I wasn't all that hungry. <laughs> you don't want me to talk about your eating habits, do you? We gotta know the secrets for how you look that way. <laughs> Thank you guys, uh, thank you both gentlemen very much. We're gonna open up, yeah, round of applause please. This was wonderful, and I know I've been able to hog the microphone, so now I'm gonna open up the, uh, the room for questions, and we'll start with, with you right there. Now we did, if you look at footnotes, you'll see where there's certain things that are said that were dramatized. But this is all factual, the, the occurrences happen. Probably not in the first 10 pages, though. That may, that <laughs> may <laughs> probably Because I didn't see that. But my question is um, specifically about Douglas Wada's name. I found it interesting that he's the only one in the family that has a non-Japanese um, name. And I wondered if there was some significance and let me repeat that question just for those of uh, people watching from online is, the question is that Douglas Wada is the only one who has an anglicized name in his family. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's a good, good observation. And I would say he probably did have a Japanese name. And like happened when people migrated to the United States, if they wanted their you know, offspring to be accepted, they gave them an Americanized name. But uh, 
that's a question that I'm going to ask the family because actually the other down, down generation, they have Americanized names as well. That's a good observation. All right. Um, another question? Oh, next to you. The question is, where do your secrets come from? No, uh, how did you, how did the research you do go into unclassified or classified documents? So believe it or not, most classified documents are declassified after 25 years. So, well, not, not totally, but we did get information and I have it where you can tell it was classified it's been declassified, marked out. So remember this when you're seeing this in the news, right? It's marked out and it'll say the date and it's unclassified and everybody who's involved with that particular piece of information is told about it. You just can't you know, think about stuff and it goes away like that. So what we did was when, when a lot of those documents, in fact, I would say most of those documents actually came from the National Archives. And, and some were open source materials, in fact, where Doug Wada himself had spoken. And now he may have been in trouble for saying some of the stuff he did, but it was so far after, the, after World War II that I don't think it was a problem. I asked because I So you can help get other documents declassified. <laughs> All right, a question back there. <laughs> Were there questions that they wanted answered in the course of their research that you were never able to answer? Actually, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so, mainly in putting the story together, we pretty much had what we needed to tell the story about Doug Water. We really didn't want to get into, you know, the cables and what was in the cables and that kind of thing too much. Uh, so we stuck with really the rudimentary type intelligence. And, and if you look at what is done today compared to then, that was rudimentary. I mean, uh, you know, it wasn't two cans and a piece of wire, but it was close to that. And there's something in the book where we actually have some of that going on. All right. I think we might have two more questions. If anyone has any questions? Okay, yes, right here. Are you still working as a consultant to the show? Thank goodness I got the call yesterday to come back to work. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I still have, I have to you know, negotiate a contract, but uh, our, our uh, prep starts next week, so this will be a two-day event for me to get the paperwork. But yes, I will be. Yes, in, oh, in front, here. Uh, yes, I, when I just wanted to say that I came here. I have a question also. My dad's 97, and he was in World War II, and I wanted to give this book to him for the holidays because I think he would just love it. Um, and my question is, is this the first time you guys have ever written anything? Mm. For both of them? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Is, is this the first time that you've written anything? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just draw a lot. You go right ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, when you're an agent, you're always writing stuff. But uh, but this is our this is our first book. Uh, well, my my first book. And then right here in front. Um, so um, you said that like most of the things like they were declassified. Was there anything that like you purposely had to leave out of the book? Hmm. Ooh, that is a good one. Was there anything you had to leave out of the book? Sorry, I just want to make sure everyone can hear. You mean by, by choice? Yeah, like, like it was information that couldn't be publicized. Or maybe shouldn't? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know, we're, we're no, nobody's, trying to, no, nobody's trying to get anybody hurt or, or killed or, uh, 
you know, the, it was so important to have a call from the family yesterday and, and having them be so proud of this. Um, and we discussed that in the writing of the book about how to handle the non-response. Um, so in some ways, that was a great moment yesterday when they, when they called and said, uh, yeah. here we go again. <laughs> Um, no, it's all right. Don't worry, I have the same problem. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> um, My wife does. <laughs> but I, I, again, I mean, you're, 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 you're. I can't, I can't talk about this enough because no one had asked the questions, right? So it's like you did whatever you did for as long as you did it. No one ever talked to you about it, and you didn't talk about it either. And then all of a sudden, us <laughs> are, are asking questions, and people talked and wanted to talk and could talk. Um, a lot of this was just maybe asking the right questions or one thing led to the next, and that's kind of the narrative of the book. It's kind of our our plot through the story um, felt very natural, you know, not, um, if you like it, if you like the book, if you like the way it's written, um, I think the TV show probably has a little bit of an imprint on it, um, maybe, yeah, <laughs> but I, again, I can't, I can't talk enough about this guy Wada because I, I, I just think about how difficult that job was for him to do at that time. And uh, the way he did that job and never spoke of it, and, and uh, you know, Leon is saying they, they want to honor him. Maybe, you know, if the book sells and they know about water, maybe they're going to honor him. About time. Mm -hmm. You know, about time. Yeah. And it's late. Yeah, you're right. The power of storytelling. What? The power of storytelling. Yeah, it is, right? And speaking of storytelling, if you would like to buy the book, I highly recommend it. It is truly, truly magnificent. Uh, you can buy it in the lobby here right afterwards where Leon and Mark will be signing copies of their book as well. Uh, so on that note, oh, by the way, I also have to give a plug to our hosts here at 92NY for having us. <laughs> And the book, once again, Ghosts of Honolulu, A Japanese Spy, A Japanese-American Spy Hunter, and The Untold Story of Pearl Harbor. Uh, one last round of applause for Mark Harmon and Leon Carroll, Jr. <laughs> <laughs>